Okay, then we start with clustering. So we already started this week during practical session looking into clustering. So I hope now practical session has already given you clear idea what clustering is. So can make now the lecture easier for you to understand. So first, what is clustering? Clustering is the technique that we apply to group up data points into different groups or categories, okay? Based on how similar they are. Like here in this class, if I like to group up the student, then I have probably many features. Now, if I'm talking only on single feature, you don't need clustering, right? So if I'm asking you whether we need to apply data mining clustering technique, for example, to group up uh, or, or to split you into two groups based on gender, does this require data mining, right? Does, even primary school can do it. So no need for data mining, no need for advanced technique. But when, when the complicate, uh, I mean the complex complexity start to appear, when I have many features, so I have gender, your favorite color, favorite food, right? The how tall you are, your weight, let's say your birthday and so on and so forth. I have so many. Now it becomes complex. I cannot just simply split you up based on all these features. Okay? So again, when you have simple tasks, you need to think whether really you need data mining or not. Again, for example, if I'm trying to split you up based on your state, so slang word in one group, Perak or in the second group, Keda in the third group, then I don't need data mining. It's just one feature asking about the state, okay? But once I start to add a lot of features, then it becomes difficult. I cannot taking into account many other features, how tall you are, your favorite color, favorite food, uh, I mean, what types of movies you like and so on and so forth then things become so much complex for a human being to do it. Then we need to use data mining techniques. And in a specific, we're looking for similarity. Since we talk about similarity, you need to think that major these algorithms depends on proximity measures. Because proximity measures have the ability to measure how similar two objects are, how different two objects are, right? So proximity means similarity and dissimilarity. So now based on this idea where clustering is trying to group up a set of data points based on how similar they are into the same group, then someone may think that classification and clustering sound similar. And that's true to some extent. Because after all classification, what it does, let's say if I decided in my data set, I have three classes, three groups, as if three groups, then classification is gonna study and classify each data point to one of these classes, class one, class two, class three, or group one, group two, group three, correct? Clustering does the same, but the difference is it depends on what is available at your hand. You need to check your data set. If your data set is labeled, then yes, go with classification. Go with classification. If your data set is unlabeled, then you cannot apply classification technique. You cannot apply decision tree. You cannot apply KNN, okay? For example, in general, you cannot apply logistic regression. You cannot apply SVM, support vector machine. Why? Because your data set is unlabeled, right? Now, in this case, you have two choices. If you say, if you insist on applying classification, yes, can, but you need to label your data set. So find a way to label your data set, even by yourself, if it is possible, or maybe you hire people to work for you to label your data set, okay? Then once you have labeled data set, classification algorithms are available to use. But if you decided, well, I don't have enough money to hire people to label my data set and etc., then you can go with clustering because clustering algorithms can work on unlabeled data set, okay? Like K-means, dbscan, hierarchical clustering, Okay, so generally these algorithms, they do not require or they don't require labeled data set. They work on unlabeled data set. And since it is unlabeled, these algorithms are under unsupervised learning. So when we talk about supervised, meaning we're talking about the algorithm that required labeled data set. Unsupervised learning, we talk about the algorithm that requires unlabeled data set. Okay.
So clustering, giving a set of objects. So when we say objects, data points, records, uh, what else? All of these are referring to the same thing. Place them in, in groups such that objects in a group are similar or related to one another in one group and different from the objects in another group. So you need to is assess or evaluate how similar the data points are in order to decide how to cluster them, how to assign them into different clusters. So here, the idea of clustering, again, if you like to think of it in real life, what do we mean by clustering? Like if you are doing hiking and you went to a mountain and then you found a group of plants, similar but not identical. So what do you do, right? Without conscious, you're gonna say, okay, these looks very similar. I put them in, into one cluster, one group. Another set of plants, they look more similar to each other. I put them in another group, okay? So this is clustering in short. So like we saw this example in the practical session, IRIS dataset is labeled dataset, right? Since it is labeled, you can go with classification. But let's say if IRIS dataset has no label or you, work, or you like to work on it without the label, you take away the label, then it becomes unlabeled. Then you need to use clustering algorithm, okay? Now, clustering has many applications, okay, and even sound interesting. For example, you can do customer segmentation. You have customers in your company, and then you would like to cluster them, to separate them or split them into different groups, right? So you can apply clustering. So customer, customer segmentation is the process of dividing a customer based into smaller groups based on specific characteristic or behavior. Characteristic here means the features, okay? So if you like to write down, so based on specific characteristics means feature. You may group your clients or customer according to their purchases, let's say, and website activity. So you have features describing their purchases and features describing their activity. Understanding who your clients are and what they require allow you to tailor your products and marketing strategy to each sector to each sector. So customer segmentation can be used also in recommender system, for instance, to recommend materials that other users in the same cluster have appreciated. So after, let's say like you have your user, after you have clustered them, let's say here like in this example, into, the, into four groups or four clusters, then you evaluate each cluster, you look into the share or the common characteristic among them, so that you can tailor your marketing strategies toward them. So for example, if I see this is the major, I like to target this group. Then I see their uh, general characteristic where their age between, let's say 15 and 25, okay? Majority are undergraduates, okay? And so on and so forth. Then when I, when I devise my uh, marketing strategy, I need to take into consideration on targeting this group of people, right? So inside the picture, for example, if you are, if you are preparing a post for them or advertisement, you don't put, for example, elder, elder people or people who are maybe over 50, for example, since the majority falls between, let's say, 15 and 25. So now you have some idea about your customers and you can target them, right? Let's say you are talking about undergraduates. So maybe you need to show inside the poster that there's undergraduate student rather than showing, let's say, a manager inside company. Right? So at least you know who they are, they come from what background, so you can target them. Also here it mentioned something interesting, you can do recommendation. Meaning, let's say after I cluster these people into separate groups, then I go check, for example, like the green group, I, I assess their users. What do they appreciate? Let's say they appreciate some type of product. Then I check who other users inside the green group, same group, who haven't purchased this product before. Okay, so based on the idea that some of your, let's say inside this group that you got people who appreciated this product, then you can recommend to the same, to the same people who haven't purchased this product before 
okay? So that because based on the idea, you already knew that these type of people appreciate these types of product. Okay, so you can also use it for recommendation, not only for marketing strategies. Another also idea for applying clustering is anomaly detection. If you remember dbscan, just we looked into a few days, dbscan shows you label minus one, right? Meaning noises, outliers. So also clustering can help you to find outliers. After you group up your data points, maybe there are some data points do not fall into any group, any cluster. They deviate, they are too far from any cluster. Then these are outliers. So if you are looking for anomaly detection, so anomaly means we are looking for outliers. Things deviate away from the norm, right? Like I gave you an example for outlier, this is easy one. If you are trying to predict the car price, so the trend inside, anyone knows that the newer the car, the price is gonna be higher, correct? The newer the car is, the higher the price is gonna be. But inside your data set, you may have collected data also about antique cars. Antique cars maybe produced 50 years back. Yet, if you check their price is high, right? Their price is high. So then these, this is a good example of outliers because this is distort your algorithm. Algorithm will be distorted. Do you mean the newer car is, the newer the car is, the higher the value is? or the older the car is, the higher the value is, right? So the, the algorithm is gonna be confused. Then we take away these outliers. We take away these outliers. That means if I'm working on predicting the car price, I make sure I don't have antique cars records inside my data set. I don't have antique cars records inside my data set. Also can be used for search engine. So certain search engine enable user to discover similar images to gain, to given reference image. Like you give them one image and then they are gonna look or discover similar images based on the image you have provided. To develop such a system, you would initially use a clustering algorithm on all photos in your database. A grouping together images with comparable features. So after you cluster your images, whatever images you have, you apply clustering, then you got, you provide one picture to the system. Now the system all has to do is to see where this photo should fall to which cluster. Is it cluster one, cluster two, cluster three, right? Let's say it says cluster three. That means all the other images inside cluster three are similar to the reference image you have provided, correct? Then you can recommend or show similar image to the image that the user has provided. You see, there are many, many applications. Image segmentation. Also, you can reduce the number of unique colors inside your images. So here as an example, here the original image, here we cluster all pixels into only 10 clusters, 10 colors. And here is where we have clustered the original data points into eight colors or six colors four colors, two colors. That means all pixels that are similar or near in value to each other, they should only be assigned to two cluster, whether like here the yellow or green, okay? So clustering has many applications. Even image segmentation, it has also different types of segmentation. If you like to study, there is semantic segmentation, there is instance segmentation, so semantic segmentation means you locate all the objects that are similar in nature to each other, like here, the chairs. So you put all chairs inside the photo into one cluster. But in instance segmentation, no, you need to differentiate each instance separately, regardless whether it has same nature or not, like the chairs, so we still need them separately. So you see, clustering has many applications. This is also interesting. So here we're doing what? Semantic segmentation. So all people should be in color, cars in another color, another cluster, pavement in another cluster, okay? So again, when you do, when you apply clustering, can allow you to do image segmentation 
one of the segmentation is semantic segmentation. Okay, nice. So you can do autonomous driving car. Also, you can do clustering for pre-processing if you like. So this is your original, let's say the handwritten digit we talked about last time. I mean, we had uh, during practical six when we talked about classification. Then if you like to enhance to enhance your, uh, your pictures, right? So to go from here to here, you see how, how it's sharp and clear? Then you can also apply clustering. You can apply clustering. So there are many applications. So you see now clustering is gonna be sub-process inside data pre-processing, okay? For the overall process, which is classification. So you can use data mining, uh, I mean, inside each other, like your ma major process or the main objective is classification. But along the way, you like to enhance the quality of your data set, like in this example. Then you can apply clustering. Okay, any question? Okay, classification is efficient and high accuracy on label data set. Clustering is for no label. Yeah, it's not about accuracy, let's say, but the point is whether you have labeled or unlabeled data set, okay? So if you have unlabeled data set, you cannot apply classification anyway, because classification require you to define your target variable and target variable represent your label, but your data set doesn't have label. Then you cannot use classification, okay? It's not, it's unapplicable because the algorithm have been designed to require X and Y. So you cannot just provide X, you need Y as well, okay? So clustering, goes well, no problems, because it has been designed to work on just the input features where we have no label, no target variable. Okay. Any other question? If you have, keep writing. So now we understand what is the idea of clustering, right? It's clear. And now we know why we have clustering algorithm instead of using classification, right? So let's look into the types of algorithms. We have many types, but the one that we're gonna mention, we already discussed all of them, by the way, during practical session. So you should have at least some idea what we're talking about. So the first type is center-based clusters, or we call it prototype-based clustering algorithm, like k-means. K-means we use depends on the idea of centroids. So it is center-based algorithm, okay? So looking for an instances center, like centroid, such as k-means. Density-based clustering, looking for continuous regions of density, backed instances, like dbscan. So we care about the density, this is why we Look last time, if you remember, when we used dbscan, we looked for epsilon because it will decide the radius, size, and how many data points we have in order to know whether we have enough density to call such data point as core, right, or border, or noise. Hierarchical clustering. Looking for clusters of clusters, like we have nested clusters like we have merged cluster one with cluster two, then we, cl we merged cluster three with four and so on until we had the last cluster. So it is clusters of clusters. So, or we call it nested clustering. Now, another, another way to, to look into these algorithms is whether they are partition algorithm, partitional algorithms or not. So partitional algorithms means unnested, like k means, for example, it assigned the data point into a single cluster, right? We don't have nested clusters. We don't have cluster of clusters. So this is, we call it partitional algorithm. They just partition the data points into a single cluster. They cannot be in, inside two clusters. We cannot say point one 
is part of cluster one and also it is part of cluster two. Cannot. Okay, this is partitional clustering. Hierarchical clustering, on the other hand, supports nested of cluster. So again, this is just to emphasize the idea. So partitional, you see, after all, we have only, we don't have overlap clusters, meaning the data points will be assigned only and only into a single cluster. Where in hierarchical clustering allows nested clusters like this case. So we see that point two, for example, belong to cluster one, cluster two, and cluster three. It's part of cluster one and two and three, All right? Here, P3, for example, it is part of cluster, of this cluster inside the circle, and the last, the biggest one inside two clusters. As we said, we have three types, the center-based center algorithm like k-means, we have the hierarchical clustering and density-based. This is just repetitive, nothing here. So we start with k-means clustering. All of you have the idea already, but let's again look into k-means. It's one of the famous algorithms, is well known when we talk about clustering. So clustering, again, this is just to show you the idea where we try to cluster data points into different cluster. And it is partitional. So you see that we have, uh, we have I mean, each data point is belong only to a single cluster. And this type is called prototype or center base because k-means work on identifying a centroid or center point inside each cluster. Okay, if you don't see it. You see the centroid? Nice, we have magnifier. So this is like a summary for everything. So it's partitional. Partitional requires number of cluster you need to specify. As we said, k-means requires you to specify how many clusters you have. It is center-based. Each cluster is associated to a centroid. So each cluster has a single centroid. Each point is assigned to a cluster with the closest centroid. So it will measure, k-means will measure how far each data point from these centroids. And based on the nearest centroid, it will assign that particular point into it. And it is basic and very simple algorithm. It's not complicated. So how k-means work? Firstly, it has three, we can, we can have three major uh, parts. The first one is initialization. Because as we said, k-means require centroids. So at first run, it's going to initialize these centroids. We have no idea where are the centroids at the first stage. So it's going to just initialize them, randomly choose data points from the data set to be centroids. OK? So again, choose the number of cluster at first and randomly initialize k cluster centroids. Then assign, going to assignment, assign each data point to the nearest centroid. So as you notice here, this picture show you, when we started at first, I think this is at stage, yeah, you see here the three stages. That's nice, place random centroid. You use magnifier again. Notice here the stages down, how they are moving. I think I have to remove, you see? So at first, it's going to just assign or choose data points randomly from the data set. OK, that's nice. Right. Well, this is assign, update. OK, place. So at first, you see we have no clusters yet, right? At first. So just we choose randomly some two data points. Since let's say k is equal to, that means we need two clusters, two centroids. So at first, k means we'll choose randomly two data points from the data set to be centroid. OK, this is the first stage. Now, second stage, assign, notice there on the left-hand side, doesn't show all. 
So assign each data point to the nearest centroid. So K-means is going to use proximity measures and evaluate and calculate the distance, how far each data point from those initialized centroid. And based on their distance, the K-means is going to assign each data point to the nearest centroid. Okay, so this is stage two. Now, stage three, after you have assigned the centroids into the nearest into their nearest centroid. Now it is time to update these centroids. So you need to update them based on the previous assignment, recalculate and find the centroid point. Simply just taking the average, the mean value for all data points in one cluster. So this is why it has been updated. Earlier, the centroid was somewhere here. Then later it has moved into this location. And then after that, go back to step two reassign data point into their, again, to the nearest centroid after the update, okay? So we need to assign again and keep assigning and updating, assigning and updating until we finish. So it's gonna take few steps. So again, initialization one time, we're done. Then we go assign each data point to the nearest centroid based on Euclidean distance, for example. Or maybe we are using, uh, what's called? I forgot what was the first proximity measures we talked about before Euclidean. Taxi cab, taxi cab, what was its name? Manhattan, yeah, Manhattan, yeah, taxi cab. Maybe, okay, so you need, uh, you can use different proximity measures, not necessarily Euclidean, but this is an example. We are using Euclidean distance between points and centroid. Then update the centroid, compute the mean of all data points assigned to each cluster and move the centroid to the mean that you have calculated. This update the location of each cluster centroid. Now repeat step two and three until convergence. So you keep going step two, step three, step two, step three, until some time where you stop. When do you stop? Until you converge. What does it mean converge? Converge meaning finding the solution. Until you find the solution. Okay, so convergence meaning finding the solution. So when we stop, I think it's already mentioned here, should be reassign data point to the nearest centroid based on the updated and recompute the centroid. This process is repeated until, okay? Until when? The centroid no longer moves significantly. That means you keep reassigning and the centroid place doesn't change much, okay? There's no changes significantly or the maximum number of iterations is reached, okay? Also, K-means has the maximum number of and assign. You can tell K means, for example, you cannot go in this iteration more than 50 times. Then regardless whether it has reached to the convergence or not, it's going to stop. Okay. So that's why here, if you notice, these steps are keep repeating. Maybe later I post this picture so you can see how it keeps. So first place, then assign. Now update. Notice. Now again, reassign then update again, then reassign, then update, right? So that was the final solution, okay? Any question? In order to use k-means, you see, very easy. You use, you import k-means, then you need to assign number of k. So based on this data set, we can observe using our eyes that we have five clusters. Then we put k equal five. Then we do called fit predict. And here the predict value for zero, one, two, as I said, this refer to the cluster ID. So here in the following slide, I also put demonstration to make it clear for you to understand. Okay. Even if you check the textbook, they're not like this. So here easier should be. So how to know this is cluster zero? Just you check cluster underscore centers. The first centroid referring to the centroid of cluster ID zero, this one. If you check the place, it's gonna pinpoint to this one. Cluster ID one is referring to this one and so on and so forth, okay?
And then when we do prediction, if let's say we are looking for the data point, so this is an example 0, 2 that we checked last time. Then, of course, if you calculate Euclidean distance is nearest to cluster ID 0, uh, 1, cluster ID 1, this is why it's going to be assigned with label 1. Okay? Clear? Let's see if any question. No question. Okay, if you have a question, please go and pause. So this is the idea of k-means. So three major steps. It depends on the idea of centroid. So this is why it's called center-based algorithm. And it is partitional algorithm where the data point is going to be assigned to single cluster. Now, types of clustering, there are two types. Whether you can go with hard clustering, as we said, when we call predict, or you can call you can go with soft clustering. So hard clustering means assign each instance to a single cluster. Now, soft clustering give each instance a score per cluster. Okay, and this score in k-means simply is the distance between the instance and the centroid. Right? So again, in hard clustering, just we are looking to assign the data point into a single cluster. In soft clustering, we are calculating the distance between the data points and the centroids of k-means. So in order to apply soft clustering, you need to call transform. So you call transform, and here it's going to give you for the first point, 0 0.2, how far it is from each centroid. So this is for centroid 0, centroid 1, centroid 2, centroid 3, and so on. And then if you check, I put in bold, showing you that this is the smallest value, indicating the hard clustering will choose this one because this one is located at column index one, referring to the centroid one, right? This is why earlier when we call predict has given us, oops, has given us one, okay? Because the smallest or the nearest centroid to each data point, okay? Now, how to measure the performance of k-means or clustering? We have inertia. So inertia is also known, same, like inside your practical session within cluster sum of squares. Now, what is inertia here, as explained earlier? Simply, you go and calculate. So firstly, you look how many clusters you have. You have two clusters. Then you go to each cluster and calculate how far the data points of that cluster to their respective centroid. How far? Then you get some value here for the first cluster. Then you go do the same for the next cluster. You calculate how far the data points from the second centroid for the second cluster. Then you sum up these two values. This is going to give you inertia. Okay, so they call it sum of squared within, within cluster sum of squared error. So to be precise, this is called also within cluster, within cluster sum of squared error. And the objective of k means to minimize inertia. As low as lower inertia value indicates that the points within each cluster are closer to each other and thus clusters are more compact. Now how to find the optimal k? Because k means require you to specify how many clusters you have. Now, first, we looked into the visualization. We used our observation, right? We used our eyes in order to identify how many clusters we have. But that is not possible all the time. <clears throat> so here, it's OK. But that is not possible all the time. OK, ignore about K. So the point is whether you need to choose K3 or K8. Again, if you're just looking into this one using your naked eyes, you decide that you have five. But again, if you have big data set, you may not able to visualize, right? We can visualize 1D, 2D, two dimension, three dimensions, but once you start to increase, it become very hard <clears throat> to visualize. Then in this case, we need a way to find the optimal K. So we're gonna use inertia because inertia is, is one of the performance measures can tell us how compact 
the data points are within the cluster. But we ask ourselves, can we just use inertia? Because after all, inertia keeps getting lower as we increase K. So if you keep increasing K, inertia will keep dropping down, no matter what, okay? So the more cluster there are, the closer each instance will be to their, its clo closest centroid. And therefore, the lower inertia will be. Then inertia, in this case, is not good performance metric because it's getting smaller as the value of K increases. Then how we can determine the right value of K? We apply inertia as a function of K, meaning we need to draw a figure like this, taking inertia. So we cannot just only assess inertia. If just you look into inertia, inertia will keep dropping down. So we don't look only to inertia. We take inertia as a function of K. So we draw inertia as well as K. We draw both, two of them. Now, after we draw, we need to look for the elbow. Where is the point that represents elbow? So you look just for your elbow shape. This one, you look to the corresponding K on the X axis, then this is the proper or the optimal value for K, four. So according to this figure, we can say that the optimal value for K is four, okay? Any question? Cancer explain again the coding and how to get the result. Okay. You can also refer to the recording for a practical session. Also, it's already mentioned there. Let's look again here. What does it mean? So here, nothing, right? Just fit. And notice we have no Y. This is unsupervised learning. Just you pass X. Now here, when you call predict, because here we're calling fit and predict at the same time. So the value here, these are the label. The label, meaning the corresponding, the first X, the first data point inside X has been assigned to the cluster ID four. The second data point inside X has been assigned to the cluster ID zero. The third point of X has been assigned to cluster ID one and so on and so forth, okay? Oh, this is a clear. Now, how to know which cluster is a cluster ID zero, which cluster is a cluster ID one, where is cluster ID two and three? Then you can call cluster underscore centers underscore. Okay? So this one simply, you look, it's going to give you a NumPy array. And if you look how many items inside this NumPy array is five, because we told K means K equals five. So it's going to give you five centroids. If you tell K means 10, it's going to give you 10 centroids. Whether correct or incorrect, this is a different story. But the point is it's going to give you the centroids that you requested for. So now just you check the index. The first item inside this NumPy array refer to the cluster ID 0. The second item inside this one refer to the cluster ID 1, ID 2, 3, and 4. So now we understand what this label refer to. So 4 referring to the centroid or to the cluster ID 4, whose centroid is this one. Okay, and so on and so forth. I hope now this is clear. If still not clear, please again post a follow-up question. I don't mind. Yeah, that's good. Actually, I put also code here because I wanted you to be not just we talk theory all the time, but when you see the code, then hopefully things become clearer, especially for those who are strong in programming, I think will appreciate this. But if you feel like even this one is not helping you, that doesn't mean you are not a good student, just you need to put more effort. And of course, you can refer to me more. So you can ask me more questions, no problem, okay? So does that answer your question? Unless if I skip the slide, please tell me which exact slide you'd like me to talk to. Okay, explain again the hard and soft clustering. Hard clustering, what is the idea of hard clustering? Hard clustering means assign the data point to a specific cluster. 
right? Because in uh, k-means anyway is partitional clustering is going to assign the data point into a single cluster. So higher clustering, we don't care how far, or I need to know how far this data point from each other centroids. Just I need the final answer. So that is hard clustering. Just I need which, what is the cluster ID for all these points, where they should be assigned to which cluster. Now in soft clustering, no, we, we give the instance and we're not asking, and we're not asking about which cluster ID should be assigned into, but we're asking how far this data point from each centroid, okay? And then later we can use these values. Maybe nobody asked why we have this, how this can be useful for us. Actually, this one can help you to generate new features. So you can use also clustering, in this case, the soft clustering to add the new features inside your data set. And then hopefully these distances that you have calculated from each cluster can help you to have better performance for your overall algorithm you are using for it. Actually, if you check, if you check the median house price, the one that we worked on, right, during practical session, if you check, if you refer back to your textbook, you will find that he has applied clustering during data pre-processing. So he has generated or he come up with some new features. And actually those features has helped him to enhance the performance of median house value predictor. Okay, so soft clustering or these values actually can help you to generate new features inside your data set. Because now they, they are meaningful. You are calculating how far this house, let's say from each cluster, you have inside your data set. So you are adding some more meaningful information inside your data set and hope that this information will enhance the performance of your algorithm, okay? So here simply, when we call transform, we have calculated how far zero comma two from cluster ID zero, it is 2.81. From cluster ID one is 0 0.32. From cluster ID, two is 2.9, cluster ID three, 1.4, and cluster ID four, 2.8. Okay, so just we are calculating the distance. After all, from this array or matrix, we can still identify the right cluster by looking for the smallest value. So the smallest value here is 0 0.3, the corresponding cluster ID for this one is cluster ID one. This is why, as I said earlier, the algorithm has assigned to one here. Okay, I hope that answers your question. If you still have question, you can still repeat again, I don't mind. So mean soft clustering more, no, it's not about more accurate. It depends on what you are using it for, okay? So now for this one, as I said, oh, I don't know the sound, hello, okay. Was well, still not as clear as before. I don't know what's happened. Yeah, so it depends on what you are using them for. So if you like to calculate how far the data points from each centroid, and then maybe you like to use this NumPy array as new generated feature inside your original data set during data pre-processing to enhance the performance of your algorithm, then you can use it, okay? So here just k-means is calculating the distance, how far it is from each one. And one application to use soft clustering, as I said, to use these new generated value as new features and put them inside your data set and push them for the next or the following training algorithm. So in our example, in practical session, we were using regression. Regression is supervised, that's fine. But we use the unsupervised clustering for, uh, he applied them for longitude and latitude. So he clustered the houses into different areas or clusters, and then he calculated the distance and put the data inside the data set during data pre-processing. And later, this NumPy array that generated by clustering is gonna be pushed along with other features to the regression algorithms to do regression or prediction for the house value, okay? So in this case, it depends on why you are applying it, okay? So here, not actually much accuracy because after all, we still need to look for how far the data point from each cluster. So based on soft clustering, we are we still need to look for the shortest path and assign the data point into single cluster. But if you like to measure to see probably 
if you have many data points belong or sitting on on i mean they have short distance to many clusters so soft clustering can help you to calculate the distance <coughs> okay any other question yeah so also here it says don't upload the lecture note last minute yeah for this one sorry because i keep updating even the last minute before i come here sometimes i see okay maybe i need to remove this easier for the student then i take them away i find some articles on the internet have nice illustration like this k means then i put so actually if you check the last last lecture many things i i change i keep changing not because i'm happy to change actually this take a lot of my time killing a lot of my time but because i wanted to make the slides easier for you to understand so from i know because like figures explain thousand words so instead of writing text inside if i have one figure for example i was looking for inertia i didn't find anyone showing inertia how it's being calculated drawing arrows if i find maybe for next semester i'm gonna replace change this take away and put again another picture so i keep updating this way but i'll try my best to post earlier like those clustering already posted yesterday right so it's not not last minute i mean but i will try my best to post them even earlier if possible for neural network i i need to change a lot because i found easy easy one to explain how to deliver uh, for example neural network to you so for sure the previous one is going to be a lot of changes inside right actually again this kills a lot of my time but i'm happy i'm doing it willingly i mean i'm happy to do this right so i learn you learn as well at the same time okay actually until now i'm teaching this course and sometimes on daily basis i learn new stuff along the way new things that i didn't know before but i'll do my best again Yeah, so if you check my explanation, probably three semesters back won't be as easy as today, right? So by the time you feel like things become more clear, you read more references. Like, for example, last few months, I found good courses on Coursera explaining uh, deep learning. It's very interesting because he made the course very easy to understand the major concept rather than going in theories. Actually, even the book now you are referring to wasn't in the main syllabus for this course. I recommended it two semesters back. And if you check this book, it's very good because it gives you minimum theory. It doesn't talk much about theories. Code is filled everywhere. If you keep flipping just the pages, you're going to see coding, coding, coding everywhere. So this book is giving you minimum theory. It doesn't focus, talk, just flip pages, talking, talking, right? If you check the other reference book, it's also good and famous book. But really is going to kill you if you read it <laughs> because you feel like okay um, i understand but i don't know where these are in this universe i mean where we are using them and how we are applying them so even the textbook i already changed i mean become this book that i'm depending on which has minimum theory and more coding so that you can understand the course even further so i try to change to make the course even more understandable so now finding optimal K fully now, it's clear. Now limitation of K-means. K-means has limitation. All algorithms actually must have limitation. There is no perfect algorithm. For K-means, has problems when clusters are, are of different sizes, densities, and they do not follow the global or shape. So what do we mean by this? So let's see some few slides. So for example, here you have clusters of different sizes. Then k-means might have problem in finding the correct clusters. This is one of the cases. Or you may have also different densities, like high density for these, for example, high density here and low density here. So though you say I have three clusters, but k-means may fail to identify these right clusters. Or actually here we have more, right? I see that we have four. There's the green one. Let's keep dancing. Or this is, yeah, the original point. Oh, okay. Yeah, because I cannot see the green. So original one, we have three clusters. So this one, this big cluster, and then these two have lower density here. This is low density. These are high density. Now, of course, we have three clusters. But when you call k-mean, 
K-mean is going to find not the right clusters. So you see it has split up this wall into two clusters and it has merged these clusters into one. Okay, so again, this is one of the limitation. And the final limitation, like we discussed during practical session, it, when it has, it prefer clusters of globular shape, meaning the cluster should like look like a ball, okay? In order for k-means to function properly. Like this example, if we look into this one, we don't have globular shape. So in this case, if you insist into applying k-means, k-means will find probably these clusters, which are incorrect, right? So these are the limitation of k-means. So now we go to the next one, density-based cluster. So now you understand the idea. Again, k-means is simple algorithm. It doesn't have too many steps to apply and depends on the idea of centroid, center-based algorithm, partitional algorithm. Uh, what else? It, it uses proximity images to calculate the distance between the data point to identify the centroids and reassigning data points into their centroid. And even finally, finding the right cluster into new data points when you call predict. Now we move on into density-based algorithm. Density-based algorithm is used for clusters of region of high density. So when you have like this example here, if you look into this one, of course, this has no globular shape, but we can identify that there is high density inside this cluster, inside this picture, which can help us to determine what clusters we have. So I'm not sure if the next picture is here, but eventually we should have like, like this. So here you can see this is the original data points. And and we inside this picture, we have high density area. So hopefully when we apply this density algorithm like dbscan, should be able to find these clusters inside. So let's look into dbscan and how it works. Also, it's not difficult to understand. dbscan depends on first the idea that it did any point inside the training set should be as one of three, whether it's core point, border point, or noise point, okay? So what do we mean by core point? Core point that has at least the specified number of minimum sample points. This is, we call it core point, okay? And border point is not a core point, meaning it doesn't fulfill this condition. It doesn't have the least number of minimum sample point, okay? So it's not core, but it is a neighborhood for a core point. That means it has a neighbor of core point. This is why it has become border. The noise point that any point is not core nor border is considered as a noise point. So this is the picture we also discussed last time. Let's say in this example, we have epsilon. This has helped us to draw a radius, a circle of specified radius. And we have the minimum sample points here. Now looking into this example, into the point A, so if you look to the point eight, how many sample points are there? If you count, we have three, four, five, six, and seven. So again, this book says, including the point itself. So here we have seven data points. Therefore, A, I'm talking about the data point A is considered as core point. If we look into B and we draw a circle based on epsilon, then we're gonna find inside this circle, we have four points then this is not core point. Now the following question comes in, is this border point? We need to assess whether this point has a neighborhood of core. Since A falls inside this circle, inside the circle of point B, then B is border point. If we take example for C, C doesn't fulfill the condition of minimum sample point seven. In addition, it doesn't have neighbor of core point then this is noise point, okay? So dbscan will identify those. So based on this, only the definition that we said, the green color are the core point is gonna be, the blue one are the border, and the red points are the noise, okay? Of course, here we have identified, let's say only a single cluster, which doesn't sound, of course, correct, but, but at least just gives you the idea what is core, what is border in this example and what is noise? Now, how, how dbscan works? So as we said first, 
go and label all points as one of three, whether core, border, or noise. Then second step, eliminate noise. Take away the noise point. Third, put an edge between all core points within the distance of epsilon of each other. That means all neighbor, neighbors of core points are, gonna, are going to be fall into a single cluster because we have many core points. But not all core points are going to be put into a single cluster unless if they are neighborhood of each other. Unless if they are neighbors to each other, then all these core points are going to fall into a single cluster. But of course, you can manipulate the value of epsilon. Then you're going to find that dbscan has identified different clusters. Okay. Four, make each group of connected core points into separate cluster. So you may have separate groups or different groups of connected core points. Each group of connected core points are going to be considered a single cluster. Finally, assign each border point to one of the cluster of its associated core point. OK? So any instance that is not core instance that doesn't have one of its neighbor is considered as anomaly or noise or outlier. OK? Clear? Now we see if anybody has a question. So eventually, if you have the right value for epsilon and minimum sample point, you should be able to identify the cluster. So again, here we have many core points, but only those core points of neighbors to each other is going to be fallen into a single cluster. These data points are core points, but fall into separate cluster, another cluster. And the yellow one, the green, red, and light blue. Let's see if any question. When I hear you reply our question and feel very happy, I'm very, very what? I I don't understand. I'm very what? Sorry, just can someone read? Gam, I don't understand. What does it mean? Oh, okay. Bye. That's okay. Okay. I'm happy for that. Thank you very much for your comments. Yeah, at least if I can make difference for you in this class, um, I will be so much happy. Okay, if not wrong, is the random data point coordinates? What do you mean, random data point is coordinate? Sorry? Oh, what is NP array 0, 2, 3, 2? If not wrong, is the random, but the random, I don't understand what is random. Data point coordinate. Now, 0, 2. OK, good question. 0 refer to the value of the first feature, x0. Means, yes, let's say if you are considering x1 is x-axis and x2 is on y-axis, then yes. 0 is at on x-axis, is the coordinate on uh, x-axis. 2 is the value on the y-axis. OK? But of course, here, because we have unlabeled, we don't have y. So we have x1, x2. So this is going to be the value for x0, uh, sorry, x1. And this one, the value of 2 is going to be the value for x2. OK? I hope that answers your question. If you have more, you can ask. Yeah, but thank you very much for this. OK, high recall clustering, the last type of clustering. Now, looking back into k-means, k-mean challenge, because requires you, the clusters, to be same size. Like just now we said, if you have different sizes of clusters, k-means may not be working very well, right? And then it requires you to decide the number of clusters. You need to decide how many clusters you have. Of course, we can use, uh, I mean, inertia as a function of k to find the elbow, but it still requires you to find. So hierarchical clustering actually help you to overcome these gaps in k-means. So hierarchical clustering, as you see here, is going to try to have nested clusters, meaning it will try to find a way to group up these data points. Of course, also based on distances, still apply proximity measures. But it's different from the concept of uh, k-means, because k-means require centroid. Here we have no centroid. So simply, hierarchical clustering is going to calculate the distance between the data point and all other data points inside the training data set, all of them. 
and then find the shortest distance and start to merge up those data points into clusters. Let's look into the algorithm. It's also not difficult to understand. Try to pay attention, and then I try to help you to understand it. So again, this is nested algorithm. Unlike k-mean, k-mean is partitional algorithm. So based on this nested algorithm, actually, we can come up with what's called dendrogram. So I wonder, I didn't mark yet the question, but I was checking the last answer page for some, some I don't know, so, some of them said one metric to evaluate classification is dendrogram. Yeah. I don't know how, but I mean, I, I ask you, clustering is not part of, of I mean, the midterm. So I, of course, I wouldn't ask you earlier about this. That's fine, but please go and study better for, for final exam. Again, I haven't marked yet, huh? not even a single paper. So now after this course, I'm going back to the school, fetch the paper, and hopefully during, during the weekend, I need to sit down and start marking. Okay, now the strengths of hierarchical clustering do not have to assume any particular number of cluster. Any desired number of cluster can be obtained by the cutting or the threshold value in the dendrogram. So as we said earlier, if you remember, so also inside the dendrogram can help you to identify the number of clusters. Now, if you check, if you remember, there was one video I given you early time. It was about CRISPDM. It was a case study about CRISPDM. Inside that one, if you like, go and read. It's about customers. He used also hierarchical clustering, and then he used it in order to identify different clusters for his customer. It's also interesting. You can refer back to that case study. But if you ask where to pick the threshold, is it we pick it at down here or at the top? It depends on you. But the general idea, they look for the long, for the large or the long uh, vertical lines. Where they are, then you can have cross determine the cutting or the, thre the threshold, in this case for Euclidean distance, to identify how many clusters you like to have. <clears throat> Now, the two main types, the two main types of clustering are agglomerative, the most common, and divisive. Actually, if you understand agglomerative, divisive is going to be automatically same because it just goes an opposite way. So in agglomerative, you start each data point as individual cluster, right? And then in each step, you start to merge closest pair of clusters until only one cluster left. Divisive is just the opposite. You start where all, all data points are inside one cluster. Then you start to subdivide or split. Okay, so here we merge, here we split. Again, here we merge, here we split. So let's focus on agglomerative. Agglomerative is also simple. Just try to pay attention. And later I'm going to prepare one example with numbers showing you how to come up with the clustering. I think for this one or another one later I see. OK, so now the idea is the basic idea of the algorithm. First, go and compute the proximity matrix. So you use Euclidean distance or maybe Manhattan or whatever. So you go and calculate all the distances for all data points against all the other data points. OK? Then let each data point be a cluster. Because agglomerated, we start where each data point is a cluster on its own. Then we have we have loop. We start with a loop where we merge the two closest clusters. And then we update the proximity measures, matrix that we have prepared until only a single cluster remain. Because agglomerative, again, start where all data points is considered as a cluster on their own. We keep merging, merging, merging until we are left with one cluster, okay? Let's see how it works. So first, let's say we have this data point. And this is our proximity matrix. We go and calculate the proximity matrix. Then after we calculate, we find the shortest or the, the nearest data points, and then we merge them up. We merge data points. So as you see, we calculate, then we merge, start merging the data point, forming the clusters. And then we update, we update the proximity measures matrix. 
and then we again keep going this way. After we update, then we look for the closest clusters and then we merge them up. Let's look into example, maybe make it easier. Now, the only, the only thing here maybe is important to understand is when we measure the distance between points is easy. All of us know how to measure the performance between points, right? Euclidean, for example, straight away. We take the values on x-axis, y-axis, if coordinates, and then we calculate. But when it comes to cluster like this, how you measure the distance? <clears throat> Let's say like this. Let's say this is, has been formed into one cluster. How you measure the distance between this, the dotted, the dot circle to all other clusters? How? Right? There we have single data point. We know how to measure distance. But when it comes to measuring distance between two algorithm, two clusters, like imagine I'm saying to measure the distance between me and your friend. Straight away, all of us know, just like Euclidean distance, immediately we calculate, right? But when it comes, let's say, between two clusters, let's say here I have three clusters, cluster one, two, three, then how can I measure the distance between these two clusters? How? I need data point, right? I need some data point from here and some data point from here. Only then I can measure the distance. So this is all why we have this linkage, the one we talk about. Because the linkage is going to help us to calculate the inter-cluster distance is only help us to determine how to calculate the distance between two clusters. Again, like take another example. Let's say if you like to calculate the distance between Slangor and Perak, or let's put it far with Kada. How? Propose, propose to me how you're gonna calculate the distance between Slangor as one cluster and, and Kada is another cluster. How? Maybe one idea someone may say, we go and find the last maybe spot or area on Slangor, right? The last one, the last point to Slangor and the first point in Kedah, the on the border, then we calculate the distance, right? And this is why we have min, single link. This is what I described is single link. The maximum is just the opposite. We go to the furthest point in Slangor and to the furthest point in Keda, then we calculate the distance. This is why it's called max. You see? So it's actually rational why we have all of this, because we are looking how to calculate the distance between two clusters. Between points, no issue. We don't need much effort. But when it comes to clusters, we have different ways. Or maybe someone will say, OK, we go and calculate, find the average point, the center point for Slangor, and the center point for Keda. Then we calculate the distance. Now we have two points. Now we can apply Euclidean distance, and this is group average. Okay? Or the third way, we, we find the centroid. We calculate the centroid from one centroid from other, then we calculate the distance, and we have other methods. But the idea is all of this is helping us to calculate the distance between clusters. Because in order to merge, if you look here, in order to merge, if you see the algorithm, in order to merge, you need to find the closest cluster. That means you need to calculate the distance between clusters, right? This is why we need the linkage type, whether you need to go with min or max or average or whatever. Understood? Because again, because of this, because you need to merge the closest. So how to merge the closest if you don't calculate the distance? So we need to calculate the distance. Now we come to another thing. Then how we calculate the distance between clusters? Then we need those linkage idea. As I said, like if you take the first point or last point from each state, and then you calculate the distance. I think I'll stop here. Just let me check if there's a question before we announce our weekend started, unless if someone of you still have class. Anyone still has class after this? Nobody, right? So now weekend. Straight away. We can start at 4.30. Wow, great. Okay. <clears throat> what is it? Okay, minimum point is set by us. Yes. The minimum point you, uh, you need to set. Okay? It's like K means you need to provide the value for K. The minimum points also you need to set. Also, epsilon you need to set. DBSCAN requires two values to run. You need to provide the minimum points and the epsilon, both of them. 
Okay, so we started last week talking about clustering, and we're almost finished. So we talked about different types, k-means and others, the DB scan and hierarchical clustering. I think we stopped here, if not mistaken, but also we already talked about some of these. OK, so hierarchical clustering is different than k-means. K-means is partitional, partitional clustering, while hierarchical clustering is nested clustering, meaning data points can be assigned to more than one cluster. All right, so they can be exist in more than one cluster at the same time. Now, now hierarchical has two types. Either you go with agglomerated or divisive. They are same in general concept, but just the opposite of each other. So agglomerative, simply what we need to do, if you remember, we need to compute the proximity matrix. So let's say we are depending on using or applying Euclidean distance or whatever. So we can use that one to compute the proximity matrix or matrix. Then we let each data point be a cluster on its own because this is agglomerative starting from each data point as a cluster on its own. Then we start to merge up data points into bigger cluster. Then we start the repeat process where we merge to closest cluster. Please highlight this word, closest, because always the point is the data points that are next to each other. That means they are similar to each other, right? Then other data points that are farther from them. OK, so they are closest. And then we update the proximity images until only a single cluster remains. Now, how to do update the proximity measures when we are uh, when we are updating it? Then this is where we use the linkage type. Okay, so if you like to keep note, linkage type is being used at this place. Please, this is, can help you to understand better. So linkage type only will be applied at this stage, where you need to update the proximity matrix, the linkage type. After we update, then again we merge the closest clusters, and then we update it again until eventually we have only a single cluster left. Then agglomerated clustering is concluded. OK. So we already talked about this again. The point is when we start to calculate the distance between two clusters, this is here where linkage type comes in. Because we know how to calculate the distance between two, two data points, but between two clusters, it can be a bit challenging and there are different types. So this is why we are studying linkage. OK, we cannot skip this type because again, think of it like if you have two states, you like to calculate the distance. How do you calculate? Just if you think about it for 10 seconds, then you have a trouble finding the coordinates. Let's let's say for state one and the coordinates for state two for which that you are going to use to calculate the distance, right? So this is why we have linkage type. Whether we're going to go with minimum means the last data point, let's say, or the nearest data point to the second state, or the furthest, which is max, or we go with average or centroid. So again, this is why we need to know the linkage because it helps you to calculate the inter-cluster distance. Enter cluster distance. So with min, let's say this is a state one, this is state two. Sometimes if you put it in real example, can make it easier for you to rational, to make it rational. So let's say this is Slangor, this is Kedal. Then how you calculate the distance between the two states? One of the way is you take the minimum, means defining or finding the shortest path between these two states. OK, the shortest path between these two states, maybe the last point where you leave Slangor to the first point where you reach Kada. Then you calculate the distance. This is the minimum, min, or we call it single link or min. OK. So in this case, we look between the proximity between the closest two points that are in different cluster. So this data point, if you see at this side, is the closest data point to the other cluster on the other side. 
And this data point, of course, is also the closest point to the other cluster on the other side. So we calculate the distance between them. So this is min. Now max is just exactly the opposite. Let's say the furthest point from Slangor where you leave it on the other side and the furthest point on Keda. For example, then you take the maximum. That means this will give you the maximum distance between the two states. Okay? And so on and so forth. So you should have got the idea. The group is different where you calculate the distances, as you see here. You calculate the average pairwise proximities, average length of edge means this, we can also call them edges of all pair of points from different clusters. So you go and calculate the distance between this data point and all the other points from the other cluster. And you repeat the same procedure for the second data point, third and fourth, then you calculate the average of all distances between the pair data points from each cluster, from different cluster. Okay, or you calculate the centroid. So centroid, like the idea we apply in k-means. That means we calculate, we find the center point for all of these. So you can think of it like you're looking for the city center, for example. Assuming, assuming, uh, just for the sake of argument, that the city center represents the centroid. Then we calculate the distance between the city center from each first state and the city center from the second state. Of course, there's no city center. Let's say take the capital from first state, the capital from second state, and calculate the distance. Clear? Yeah, just sometimes if you make it rational, easy to remember. Otherwise, I know there are many things to recall. Always rationalize it to make it easy for you to remember. Okay, now how to apply minimum or single link? As we said, remember, you can refer back to the slide for agglomerative and follow up. So firstly, we go and calculate the proximity matrix. So this is our proximity matrix we have already calculated. Then we look for, if you look for repeat, now we are inside the loop. Inside the loop, what the loop says, merge the closest points, right? Or the closest clusters. Now the closest point in this case is between P3 and P6. Yeah, so visually these are the two points, but if you calculate the distance, we'll, we'll give you the smallest distance, okay, 0.11. Can we take zero, 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 the diagonal line? Because this is just calculate the distance with the point itself, right? So don't stick here. Then you have infinity loop. <laughs> you, never leave, you never leave because always you're gonna just stuck at zero. So you don't look to the, to the diagonal. Diagonal, ignore the diagonal. Look to the other or the data points or the measures, the distances of the diagonal and then find the closest or the smallest value. In this case, we can merge P3 and P6. So we merge them into one cluster, you notice here, and now we update the proximity matrix measure. Now here we put P3, P6, referring that these two have, have, have been merged up into a single cluster. Okay, and then the other data point, just you copy paste from the previous one. So you don't need to recalculate the distance between P1, P2, right? P2, P4, P2, P5, just copy paste. Now, only the challenge when it comes where you need to calculate the data point, the distance between the points and the cluster. So here where we need, to, where we start to apply min or the single link. As I said, at this stage inside the algorithm, inside repeat loop, only now we need to apply min or link. So in this case, how to calculate, how we come up with 0 0.22, for example, here, how we come up with this value because now we need to calculate the distance between P1, P1, where's P1? P1, all right, point one and this cluster, P3, P6. How to calculate? I think there's a slide show, showing you. This is an example, but if the same one, this is max. Yeah, so this is an example, but you can replace the numbers based on, on the other slide, but same point. So let's say we are looking to calculate the distance between 
three, six. Three, six means cluster, cluster one. Two, five means cluster two. Then you go and calculate the distance between two and three, two and six, five and three, five and six. Right, so notice you need to calculate the data point or the other side, same. So distance between three and two, three and five, three and five, six and two, six and five, and then pick the minimum one. So among these, which one is the minimum? Is 0 0.15, okay? So when you update later stage, when you start to merging, when you need to calculate the distance between P36 and P52, then you take the distance is 0 0.15. So the point is we find the smallest or the shortest value between two clusters. OK. Now for max, max is just the opposite. Let's say we are intending to calculate the distance between P36, this one, and P4, this one. Then how to calculate the distance between these two, between point P4 and cluster 1, which has P3, P6. Then very easy. Again, we put the equation. Just we start to calculate the pairwise value. So the distance between three and four and the distance between six and four. After we calculate normal Euclidean distance, we get 0, 15, 0, 22, and we take the max. We take the max because this is max. Okay. And same here, other examples for you to practice. So you can check the other example. Same idea, simple. Just you take the max, max value. Here, minimum, that one is max. Average, average. As we said, you calculate all the prox proximities between the data points of different clusters, and then you calculate the mean for all distances that you have calculated. You take the mean after all. I think here there's an example. Okay. So this one is for, yeah, this is for average. So for example, if we are calculating the distance between cluster, which is a three, has the data point three, six, four, three, six, four, this one, the one in red, and then cluster, which has the data point one, meaning the data point itself. Now we're not calculating five, that's we're calculating the distance between one and this cluster. So we start to calculate the pairwise distances, three and one. Then you should get 22, three, six and one. The distance is 0 0.37, four and one is 0 0.23. Then we sum up divided by the total number of distances, which is three. Then we get 0 0.28 and same for the other clusters. OK, so this is the average. The centroid you already knew. Now the comparison. The linkage actually will make the only difference because all of them we are using agglomerative, but the linkage type will decide which clusters to merge up, which clusters to merge up. Okay, so this is why if you try, if you try different linkage, you will get or you, you will have different results. So here it shows you how the clusters are going to be formed by using minimum linkage here by max, here by group, and this is by work where I didn't include here the slide, but if you're interested, you can refer back to your textbook. But the point is each linkage will yield different nested clusters. OK, if you are interested to know which one to use, you can read on your own. Find each one has some weakness and some strength, right? So each one has some weakness, some strength. Then you can, based on the problem you are working on, you may decide which linkage to use, but I'm not going to go through that. But if you are interested on your own, you can search on your own. OK. I think that's all. Yeah, this is the last slide. The rest are hidden. Any question? Let's see the group. I'm sure now I'm going to find a question about practical tests. Just predicting. Huh? I'm just doing some prediction. Postpone assignment. This is done, right? Well, this is a new one, I seem like. We already postponed. <laughs> yeah, sorry, we cannot do any more. Yeah. Week, week, week 12, 
I already have a lot of things to wrap up. OK. I think there is no other question. Anyway, if you still have question, you can write here. But sorry, we cannot postpone anymore. So we already uh, told you, right, which one, where was the submission date, the due date for the assignment week? It was Monday. I remember it was Monday, Monday, 4th of September. OK, so please remind me to update the MS team because it's still on 1st of September. OK, if no question. Then I created today an example for you. I just spent some time writing a clustering example to show you for K means. Right. OK. So let's let's take an example, see how we can do k-means. Let's say we have a data points like this, just single dimension. We have data set with one feature, x, only x, x1. You can think of it. Where we have these values, minus 1, 7, 9, 8, 1, and 10. Now, assuming the centroid, because of the first stage, centroid should be initialized. So I have initialized centroid 1 to be value. To be value my to be value one for this data point, centroid two for data point nine, because I'm looking for two clusters. Okay, so again, I repeat, we have this example for data set with only single feature. I have the only one feature, one column, okay, and only six points inside this data set. Now, K means remember the first stage, what's gonna do? The first stage, initialization. Right, initializing the centroid. So I have initialized my centroid because I'm looking for two clusters. So centroid one is going to be assigned for the data point one. Centroid two is going to be assigned to the data point nine. Good. Now we come to the question. Using Manhattan distance, for example, of course, we can use proximity measures. We have Manhattan, we have Euclidean distance. Right, so not necessarily all the time, just we use Euclidean. We have other options. So in this example, let's take Euclid Manhattan. Actually, it's easy to calculate, right? You don't need calculator. So we have Manhattan simply already. The equation is here written for you. So let's say the distance between X1 and X2 simply where you're calculating the D. D refers to the distance between data point one, data point two, where you calculate the subtraction of their values with the absolute. So the result, you take the absolute value of the subtraction. So if you got like this, let's say how we can assign each data point to the nearest centroid. OK. I don't know some people just seems busy with other stuff. Please try to pay attention. At least hopefully you you remember something from this class. OK, now so we need to calculate the we need to assign the data point to their nearest centroid. So what we need to do, step one, calculate the distance between all data points and centroid one, and data points and centroid two for all data points. So again, calculate the distance for the data points and centroid one, centroid two for all data points you have. So meaning we go to the data point minus one, and then we apply the equation. X1 in this case is going to be minus 1 in our case. Then minus 1 and the distance with the centroid 1. Centroid 1, if you remember, you can refer back to the slide, but I already put it here, is 1. So we calculate the distance between minus 1 and 1, and minus 1, the other centroid is 9. This is for data point minus 1. Just you substitute inside the equation, minus 1, and then minus the second, the centroid is 1, minus 1 become minus two, you take the absolute, become two. And then same for the distance between minus one and nine, become minus one, minus 10, minus one, minus nine, become minus 10, the absolute is 10. Just Manhattan straight away, even you don't need calculator. So meaning these are the distance between the data point minus one and the centroid one, centroid two. We have calculated the distance using Manhattan. Now we just repeat 
the same procedure for all the other points because remember you need to repeat the same procedure for all data points you have so we repeat again for data point seven the second data point just copy paste and just replace here seven seven instead of minus one minus one the centroid are same one nine you calculate the distance you get six and two meaning the distance to centroid one is six the distance to centroid two is two and we repeat for data point nine data point eight here data point one data point ten so step one completed we calculated the distance for all data points how far they are from centroid one centroid two of course in this example we are looking for two clusters we have only two centroids if you have three clusters then of course you need to calculate also the distance to centroid three okay but this is simple just we have two centroids any question? Now, what we do, we put the result into a table. Then, now we do assigning. But first, let's put the result to the table. So these are our data points, minus one, seven, nine, eight, one, ten. And then we pick the results from here. So the first one, the distance to minus one, centroid one, two, centroid two, the distance, I mean, ten. So we put two and 10. Then same for seven is six and two. Six and two. For data point nine, eight and zero. Eight and zero. All right, just copy paste. Just you take the values from earlier calculation, you put them into the table. So now we got the distance to centroid one, the distance to centroid two. Okay, so be careful now huh? here when you do the calculation. I followed first, calculated the distance to C1, centroid one. So be careful. If you calculate centroid two first, then centroid one, then you need to swap the values when you put them inside the table. I mean, just make sure you match between the results and the table, whether it's centroid one or centroid two. Once we place all the data, then we come to the last column. So first we put the data into the table. We have distance to centroid one, distance to centroid two. Now, after we place all the results from the earlier calculation, then we come to the last column. Now, in order to assign the, center, the data point to either centroid one or centroid two, what we need to have to look at? The shortest distance, right? So here, minus one is nearest to centroid one or centroid two, based on the calculation. Is nearest to centroid one, because the distance is only two, right? The distance is only two, while the distance to centroid two is 10. Correct? So minus one is nearest to centroid one. This is why we assign the data point to centroid one. Just we look for the minimum value. Now we go to the data point seven. We look the distance from seven to centroid one is six. Seven to centroid two is two. Then the smallest value is two. We assign seven to centroid two, okay, clear? That's all, so you keep repeating the same others. Here, nine should be assigned to centroid two because smallest value, centroid two. Eight has smallest value, seven or one? One, then centroid two. One for data point one, the smallest distance is to itself, the centroid one, centroid one, then 10, the data point 10 is nearest to centroid 2, centroid 2. OK, straightforward. Once you done calculation, just straightforward. OK. Now, if you remember, K means what it says. So after we initialize, we, uh, we calculate, assign the value to their nearest centroid. The third step, what do we do? We update the centroid, All right? We update the centroid based on the assignment that we have done for the data points. Now we need to calculate the centroid. So compute the new centroid. So for new centroid one, simply you look back to the table. Which data points belong to centroid one? Minus one and one. Only data points, only two. So we calculate the average minus one plus one divided by the total number of points belong to centroid one is two, then it's zero. So centroid one has been updated from one to become zero.
Then we do the same thing for centroid two. So centroid two, how many points belong to cluster two? We have four points. You see, seven, nine, eight, and also ten. So we put seven plus nine plus eight plus ten divided by four, and the new centroid is for centroid two for cluster two is eight point five. Then of course, k-means can keep going. You should calculate again the distances for all the data points to this new centroid. So meaning if you like to keep going, then you can come back here, okay, here, but change to the new centroids. So now centroid one has become zero. Centroid two has become 8.5. Then you repeat the procedure to do, have a new calculation. Then you put them inside the table again, and then you assign the data points according to the new calculation. Then you compute again the new centroid and keep going like this until, if you remember, the algorithm says until the centroids are not changing significantly. Maybe they move from zero, let's say, to 0 0.1. I mean, just small changes, meaning there is no great changes in the, or maybe the data points are not moving anymore, are not being reassigned to any other clusters. That means the centroid will remain same. Then we stop or we have the maximum number of iteration. Remember, k-means has the maximum number of iteration. Maybe we put two, then that's it. Even we still can go further, but we already set up a limitation to, to conclude the calculation. Any question? Any question, Stephen? Any question? No. Now, let's draw a figure and see whether the first time we assign data point to the centroids matches or not. Now, if we just draw, because here we have single dimension for the data point, so just we put uh, one dimension, right? And then refer to this X minus one, seven, nine, eight, one, ten, and then we put X referring to these data points. We have six data points. I have already assigned them inside this ruler. Now, if we look just by using our own observation, shouldn't be cluster one, including data point minus one, one, and cluster two, seven, eight, nine, ten, right? Because they are nearest to each other, correct? I mean, if I ask you just to find the natural, the natural clusters, even if you don't know k-means, you've never attended data mining, no need. Just I'm asking you the natural clusters, meaning the data points that are closer to each other. Won't you recommend the solution? Correct? Right? I'm looking for natural, natural clustering. Just looking by using our eyes, looking to the figure. Won't be, this is the correct solution because we see the data points are nearest or closer to each other in cluster one. So we can propose this is cluster one, this is cluster two. Now remember, this example is only for two clusters. I'm not looking for three. Maybe if you're in your mind saying, okay, why not? I have this one cluster. This is another cluster and this cluster three. No, because the question is only for two clusters. We're looking for two clusters only. Agreed? Now, won't that match our calculation earlier? So you see that cluster one has data point minus one and one. So centroid one has data point minus one and one. Correct? Centroid one. Correct? And the other data points belong to centroid two, cluster two. So that concludes based on the figure and finding that our earlier calculation and the figure matches to each other. Whatever you can observe from this example by just simple drawing matches your calculation results. Clear? Okay, is that difficult? Easy, right? Just you see also Manhattan is nice, the straightforward. Yeah, so that's conclude clustering everything. Any question?